How's everybody going? How's everybody doing? Did that storm wake you guys up? Uh, no. 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 Just me. vascular occlusions and it's two parts so today we're going to do kind of a vascular occlusion and then I come back in a few weeks and we'll talk about some less common entities. So um, hopefully since it's a small enough group you guys can just ask questions hopefully there's a fair amount of participation I could talk about the images and kind of what we're thinking um, but we'll just get started so the first picture oh wait oh this one Okay, so anybody? What do we have? It's um, pretty straightforward. Yeah, so there are some patches of uh, uh, white in the retina, probably cotton wool spots, mm -hmm. most likely. Um, could be ischemic, could be uh, diabetic, could be hypertensive. Yeah. Um, what part of the retina, which the retinal layer is affected by a cotton wool spot? So, Yeah, so it's a nerve fiber layer infarct. So nerve fiber layer infarcts, it's um, caused by a retinal arterial obstruction. Um, usually they'll fade over a couple of months. And so Becca hit on uh, differential uh, for a cotton wool spot. Does anybody have anything else that they would keep in mind for cotton wool spots? HIV retinopathy, um, vasculitis, leukemia, uh, I, this patient I actually saw a couple weeks ago, and this was radiation retinopathy. She'd had uh, optic nerve meningioma that had been treated with radiation. Um, so that's the big thing with cotton wool spots. They're really never normal. You see a cotton wool spot, you're not just going to say, oh, that's nice, and leave it alone. You've got to really investigate a cotton wool spot and, and figure out why they got a cotton wool spot. But it's typically hypertension, diabetes. Um, keep in mind HIV retinopathy, anemia, radiation retinopathy, sickle cell disease, which we hardly ever see here, but does exist, and um, leukemia vasculitis. So investigate a cotton wool spot if it shows up in your clinic. Okay, what about this picture? Anybody? See like white, uh, retinal whitening yeah. along like what looks to be like maybe retinal artery. It's so like a branch retinal artery occlusion. Exactly. So that's a branch retinal artery occlusion. Um, so it's a blockage of a retinal artery, and you'll get this edematous opacification that can happen within hours. And then this is another example of a branch retinal artery occlusion. This was a 44-year-old woman I saw in my clinic a few weeks ago um, that had this branch retinal artery occlusion. And this so what kind of embolus, does, does anyone know what kind of embolus we call that? Platelet, platelet fiber and embolus, yeah. So it's usually several disc diameters in length and completely occludes the arterial. She came in complaining of this banana-shaped uh, defect in her vision that had been there for a few days. And this was her OCT. Oh, sorry, I'm doing two computers, so. <laughs> Has anybody seen this OCT finding before? Rachel? It's PAM, yeah. So it's paracentral acute middle maculopathy. And um, do you know which retinal layer it's affecting? Uh, so it's the, the, well, I guess their outer flux form. Internuclear, like typically, but yeah, it does look like it's affecting the outer plexiform layer. Sometimes it, oh, it can be a little more patchy, um, but it's this diffuse hyperreflective band here in the internuclear layer, and it's been described mostly in vascular disease, but it can also be idiopathic, and you can see it in arterial obstructions. Okay, next one. This on call. This is 
ever. Okay, <laughs> so um, yeah, so this is uh, kind of our classic cherry red spot right there. And you have this edematous uh, kind of whitening of the posterior pole. What kind of finding are we seeing in the uh, blood vessels? Does anyone know what we call that? Box scarring, yeah, so you can see this kind of segmental columning of the blood vessels from the occlusion. Um, and then this picture is interesting. I think uh, I just got a note from Dr. Taven. I think I'm seeing this patient next week. Can you guys tell me what looks like um, is happening here? It's kind of blurry. I screen grabbed that off axis. I guess that's not the best way to do it, huh? I should ask the fellows yeah, how to do it. To do it <laughs> anyway, so um, right here, what does that look like? This continuum here. There's a plaque. Looks like a plaque, an embolus there, some plaques in the blood vessels here. You have uh, edema and opacification of the posterior pole with a cherry red spot, but what's happening here? Yeah, so there's that ciliaretinal artery that's perfusing this little area, and the OCT is pretty cool, actually. Because um, you can see on the OCT, so kind of the typical findings of an OCT um, and a acute ar arterial obstru uh, obstruction is this kind of diffuse hyperreflectivity. You use, lose the cellular details and the cellular layers, but in the area, can you guys see the pointer? I can't really see it. It's so tiny, isn't it? Look at that little dot. Um, but over where the area of the cilioretinal artery, you can see the the normal cellular layers pretty nicely. So that is a CRAO um, with cellular retinal sparing. And then this patient actually had a ultrasound too, and you can see the plaque in the central retinal artery. Oh yeah, that's a really tiny dot, huh? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's the B scan that Dr. Harry did. So, um, for causes of um, arterial occlusions, what's the most likely cause? Where are you looking? Embolic, yeah. And where's the most likely sources of embolic? Uh, is it carotids or the heart? Exactly, that's where you gotta look, is the carotids in the heart, that's about 90%. Um, what's a less likely cause of uh, arterial occlusion? Embolitis. Yes, giant cell arteritis. So that's what you gotta keep in mind. Especially if you don't see an embolus, you really wanna keep giant cell arteritis in mind. And Got to rule that out, especially in elderly patients. Less likely causes are going to be trauma, coagulopathies, collagen vascular disease, the chefs, leukemia. So those are um, the most likely sor sources, causes. Okay. This, so th these are just pictures of different embolic sources. So, um, you know, usually it's uh, we have cholesterol plaques, platelet fibrin plaques, which we showed you a picture of, calcific plaques, which are coming from the heart, and those are usually kind of this chalky white uh, plaque. And that um, one's a calcific plaque. Yeah, yeah, this one looks like a calcific plaque, and it's kind of chalky white. I think the biggest thing that um, to emphasize is you see the plaque, you know, it's not really a highly predictive value to determine if it's heart or cardiac, you've got to look at both. You can't just say, oh yeah, that's chalky white, yeah, that's the heart. You, you know, really, you got to have that pretty aggressive work up and figure out where it's coming from. Less common causes of emboli are fat, talc, and you can also see corticosteroids that can travel through the arteries and, and cause emboli. So here's some more examples of different uh, embolic photographs that really aren't showing up that well. So for the hole and horse plaque, usually you'll see it kind of lodging at a bifurcation of an artery. And the hole and horse plaque, usually it doesn't occlude the flow, it doesn't really cause an arterial ob an, uh, obstruction very well, very often. Um, usually kind of the blood will travel around it. Um, but the calcific embolus, you'll see it often at the optic nerve head and it will occlude flow. And usually a calcific embolus doesn't fade away. That will be there forever. But a hole in horse plaque can fade over time. And then this is an example of the platelet fibrin embolus. And that'll just fill the whole vessel, cause an arterial obstruction. It can be several disc diameters in length. 
So the most common uh, symptom for central retinal artery occlusion is patients will come in with sudden vision loss, no pain, they can't see at all. They'll often have episodes of amaurosis preceding it about a quarter of a time. And on exam, you'll see this cherry red spot. Does anybody know what the cherry red spot's from? Why we see the cherry red spot? It's like the underlying cord. It's, you don't have like the pigment in that area. Exactly, because the ganglion cell layer is thinner there and the nerve fiber layer is thinner there. So you're seeing the normal colloidal vasculature and everywhere else is edematous and opaque from ischemia. Um, you'll, that edema and the cherry red spot will fade over a month and then you're left with a really pale nerve, really sclerotic attenuated blood vessels. Initially, you'll see that box carring of the vessels where you see kind of columning of the blood flow through the vessels. On floor scene angiogram, you'll have a delay in arm to retina time, often, you know, 40 seconds till you're getting flow through the retinal arteries and then delay in the AV transit as well. So for a central retinal artery occlusion, basically the thrombosis gets, um, sorry, there's a thrombosis, or an embolus, sorry, not a thrombosis, but an embolus just right at the lamina cribosa, and you'll get irreversible retinal damage after 90 to 100 minutes. This is why it's hard to do any treatments or trials or studies because patients don't usually present that quickly. You know, you guys probably see them quicker than I do. Usually I see them after they've already had their work up, to be honest. What's happening in this picture? Does anyone, can anyone tell? It so it's like retinal edema? Yeah, so um, this is actually a cilioretinal artery occlusion in the setting of a central retinal vein occlusion. So the most common cause of a cilioretinal artery occlusion is actually a CRVO. And so the idea is that there's a thrombosis at the CRVO site that leads to stasis in the cilioretinal artery and leads to an occlusion. Um, what's something else to think about for a cilioretinal artery occlusion? GC. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That is the answer. Whenever you see that, that's the answer. <laughs> cilioretinal artery. Um, yeah. So yeah, consider GCA. So the ciliary retinal artery is coming from the posterior ciliary vessels, so it's not coming from the central retinal artery. About a third of eyes will have a ciliary retinal artery, and um, and about 15% it'll supply the macular circulation. So in this photograph, um, this is kind of a cherry red spot right here with the central retinal artery occlusion, and then there's a ciliary retinal artery here that's perfusing this little tiny area of the macula. Unfortunately, it didn't go a little further over <laughs> for this picture. Okay. So people have tried a lot of different things. Um, to restore vision from a central retinal artery. Nothing's really been shown to be that efficacious, um, but people have tried to lower the pressure doing AC taps. I've tried it um, if they come in quick enough. People have tried to do kind of ocular massage. You'll put like a contact lens on the eye and try and massage the eye. The idea is to dislodge the embolus, allow it to move downstream and restore blood flow. I've seen patients that have had hyperbaric oxygen treatment. Um, people have tried to um, do intraarterial TPA and catheterize the ophthalmic artery, but that's a pretty high morbidity and mortality associated with it. Um, I've seen people present um, trying to gag the embolus and kind of restore blood flow that way. Um, but nothing really works that well because they have irreversible ischemia after, you know, an hour and a half, 100 minutes. So um, it's hard to, to restore vision. Um, about 15% of eyes will develop neovascularization, and it typically will occur within one month. So it happens pretty quickly. I think that the, the biggest thing that... Um, that we need to do for arterial occlusions is um, recognizing them and then doing the systemic workup and doing an expedited workup through uh, neurology often. 
there's been a movement to start calling this acute retinal ischemia uh, and to really push it into the neurology kind of stroke world so people take it seriously. There's been a lot of studies that have shown that ophthalmologists and optometrists, we see these, and I don't think here, but I, I have seen it in the community where we don't get that expedited workup to look for uh, cerebral infarcts and the underlying cause. Um, a few months ago, I had a patient that was referred in for an arterial occlusion, just a BRAO, um, and they, I don't know, I guess the referring doctor didn't recognize the urgency of it, and by the time they got to me three or four weeks later, they'd had a massive stroke, they'd had a carotid endarterectomy, and I think that if we would have recognized the arterial occlusion, started the workup, got the CAEA before they had the stroke, they would have had a, a better outcome. So. Um, so there's a pretty high rate in central retinal artery occlusions of finding uh, cerebral infarcts on MRI scans. So um, kind of the policy here, and whenever I've had to coordinate this, I've found it to work pretty well with the inpatient stroke team. But if it's been, um, if they've had vision loss less than seven days, uh, you're supposed to coordinate an expedited inpatient stroke workup. And um, typically I call the stroke team on call and they usually admit them and get everything going and I really haven't had an issue. If it's been longer than seven days, then the policy is that we're supposed to start the workup and then get them into the stroke team after that. And kind of the workup, you guys know the workup, right? What are they going to do? Carotid ultrasound, they'll get like uh, DFC and yeah, basic lab work echo. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they'll do the bubble study and they'll they'll rule out GCA and typically they'll start aspirin and a statin if, if it's not contraindicated. Oh. I guess I should, I should I wish I could do this wide like a uh, Bluetooth to there. That would be cool. We're, we're not at that point, are we? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that is the work of that we were just talking about. But I found whenever I've called the stroke neurology team, I think they're really receptive to this. Have you guys had issues on call? Yeah, it's been really. Yeah, usually the, we have a patient that comes in. I had two branch right, retinal artery yeah. in one week, and they page you the ED page with me, and then the neurology team page with me because they are like in the TP, especially if they're in like the TP window. Yeah. Yeah, I found them to be. To be um, this is just a patient of mine I saw a couple weeks ago. Um, this was his initial OCT a year ago from his CRAO. And um, you can see that hyperreflectivity, the edema, kind of loss of cellular details. And then over a year, this is what the OCT will look like. And so it becomes really atrophic and thin. And then less commonly, I actually don't know if I've ever seen an ophthalmic artery occlusion that I, I was trying to think if I've ever seen one. I really don't think I have. But um, their vision is worse than a CRAO. It's usually light perception or no light perception. There's no choroidal or retinal filling on the FA. And the ERG will show an absent A and B wave. There's no cherry red spot. The most common thing to cause this would be um, giant cell. Um, but you could also see it with the internal carotid dissection, mucor, or complications of surgical Okay, any questions on artery occlusions? Got that? Okay. So, now, what do we have? Cerebio. What else would be in your differential for a Cerebio? Yep, we have that for sure. Um, the other things um, you want to consider, hyperviscosity retinopathy, often that'll be bilateral, ocular ischemic syndrome. The difference with uh, ocular ischemic syndrome is that typically the vessels aren't quite as dilated and tortuous and the hemorrhages are usually kind of deeper retinal layers. And then this um, is the BRBO, <coughs> and it's uh, segmental hemorrhages at an AV crossing <coughs> site typically. You can often see cotton wool spots as well. And then later stages of a BRBO, and this isn't showing up as well. But the big thing, um, you know, when you look and do an examination, you're, 
you can see these kind of uh, what we call collateralization across the median rough A. So you'll see these blood vessels that start to cross over here, and this is allowing another drainage site and outflow site. This patient also had neovascularization of the disc with that attenuated vessel, and um, you can kind of see here the sectoral PRP that was done for the neovascularization. So a BRVO is um, basically a compression of the retinal vein at the AV crossing site, and there the arteries overline the vein in this common adventitial sheath, and that uh, thickened arterial wall starts to compress the vein, leads to turbulent flow and digital damage, and then a thrombosis. Um, you want to consider an inflammatory cause if it's not associated with an AV crossing site. The most common quadrant that's affected in a vein occlusion is, uh, in a branched vein occlusion, is superior temporal about 60% of the time. And so this is a kind of a typical BRVO, superior temporal at this um, Uh, but you can see up at that uh, AV crossing site, you can see the artery in the vein where the occlusion starts. Oh, so it does come. It's just, it's kind of finicky, huh? Okay. So what are some risk factors for a vein occlusion? The biggest thing is age, hypertension, glaucoma. Um, Diabetes is not an independent risk factor, and that comes from the eye disease case control study, so that'll crop up on uh, OCAP. So diabetes is not an independent risk factor for branch vein occlusion, but it is for central retinal vein occlusion. Um, the vision loss acutely, you'll see macular edema, hemorrhages, ischemia, that can lead to vision loss. And then long-term chronic vision loss can be related to subretinal fibrosis, pigmentary changes. It can develop epiretinal membrane formation, glaucoma, vitreous hemorrhages. So the outcome really depends on the severity. And often the uh, resolution of the macular edema is associated with the formation of those collaterals. And this floor scene shows pretty well this collateralization that's happening in a chronic BRVO, and so these collaterals just allow another outflow system for the macular edema and improvement in vision, so those patients actually do better if they have that collateral formation. In a central retinal vein occlusion, the collaterals occur off the optic nerve, and you'll see these optociliary shunt vessels. In a CRVO, um, you're getting compression of the retinal vein at the lamina curvosa, and they get this increased retinal capillary pressure with associated macular edema and retinal hemorrhages. Um, just to compare the risk factors for a CRVO versus a BRVO, um, the, the one kind of thing to keep in mind is diabetes was an independent risk factor for a central retinal vein occlusion. Um, when do we work up these patients? Let's see, so do you guys know when we kind of typically would work up a CRVO or a BRVO? Mm -hmm. What about like an age cutoff, do you know? So usually if they're younger than 50, we do a work up to, um, to figure out why they had a vein occlusion. If they're older than 50, age is a business risk factor. Um, for a CRVO, we kind of break it down into the non-ischemic and the ischemic CRVOs. I feel like my PowerPoints are different. I think I changed it. Oh, anyways, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> So for the non-ischemic CRVO, they usually have better vision, they have less ischemia, they have a better visual outcome. Um, for an ischemic CRVO, it's 10 disc diameters of non-perfusion that you'll see on floor scene angiography. They'll often have an afferent pupillary defect, and the ERG will show a uh, reduced or um, flat B wave. Does anyone know what this is? Hemiretinal vein occlusion. So would we classify hemiretinal vein occlusion as a CRVO or a BRVO? Does anyone know? It's a CRVO. 
know. So um, what's happening in a hemiretinal vein occlusion is basically an anatomic variation where the superior and the inferior draining retinal veins actually meet posterior to the lamina cribosa. So it's actually happening at the optic nerve head behind the lamina cribosa. And it actually has a higher risk of neovascular complications than a CRVO or a VRVO. So we kind of manage it like a combination of the two, um, but it is considered a CRVO. So instead of um, you know, these retinal veins meeting here at the optic nerve head, they meet behind the lamina cribosa, and you get an occlusion there behind the lamina cribosa, and that's what leads to hemiretinal vein occlusion. So um, things to consider. So vein occlusions, when they come to our clinic, most of us will start to check the blood pressure right away. Often it's high, kind of work with a primary care doctor to control the blood pressure evaluating for glaucoma, working with the glaucoma doctor, or primary eye um, physician, and then, like I said, under 50, do a workup. I think the other thing that we'll see a lot of uh, kind of younger women that have vein occlusions, and um, they're often on either estrogen, oral contraceptives, or um, hormone replacement therapy, so I think that's an important thing to keep in mind and see if that's something they're able to come off of, um, because that can increase their risk of vascular Um, this is kind of like a starting point for doing a hypercoagulable workup, um, obviously. Um, but protein C, protein S, homocysteine, do factor V Leiden, CBC, cholesterol panel. And then if you really aren't getting an answer, I've ended up referring patients to Hemonc to help do a workup too if I can't get to the bottom of it. So I think the hardest thing about vein occlusions is the studies, and these are always gonna come up on OCAPs, and it's trying to keep them straight and what they are, right? So um, there's really like the three main, these are like the landmark vein occlusion studies that you've gotta know. I'll tell you how I remember them. I don't know if it'll help you guys, but the oldest study is the one that got the BBO and the CBO in the name, right? It's the oldest study. So what's the oldest thing we were doing for vein occlusions? Laser. laser. So those are the laser studies. So they got the name, they're the laser studies, they're from like the 80s, the 90s, so that's how I remember the BBO and CBO. Score, does anyone know what score is? Yes, so corticosteroids is in the name, like core, corticosteroids, that's how I remember it. That's the corticosteroid study. So that's how I remember it. And then Bravo and Cruz, does anyone? No, it's Antifa It's Jeff. It's ranibizumab. And so I remember it B for BRVO, R for ranibizumab, C is CRVO, R, ranibizumab. So that's the first kind of anti-VEGF. There's more studies, but those are the ones that tend to crop up on the test the most because they're the landmark studies. Um, so BVOS, this was in like the mid 80s and there was two questions. Basically, is there a reason to do macular grid for macular edema due to a BRVO? And then the second question, a benefit to PRP for neovascular disease. So um, basically they found that macular grid improved two lines of vision in the majority of patients and treated eyes were more likely to have vision better at three years. They started the laser treatment at three months after presentation. And then for PRP, sectoral PRP reduced the risk of uh, hemorrhage and neovascular complications after the development of neovascular disease. So we don't do it for the ischemia, but once neovascular disease develops, like here, then we would start sectorial PRP. So that's the BVOS. CVOS, same questions. It was like five or six years later, early 90s. Photocoagulation, reduced neovascular complications, and then macular grid, does that help macular edema from a CRVO? They also follow the natural history. So from the CVOS, um, macular grid really didn't help improve vision. So that's why often we don't do grid laser for a CRVO. It did, um, PRP did um, help after neovascularization developed. So we don't treat just ischemia, but we treat neovascularization. So BVOS, BRVO, you'll treat macular edema with grid. This was our gold standard until the next studies came out. 
treat knee vascularization after it develops from a, the CVOS, no macular grid laser for uh, macular edema and SCRDO. So the SCORE study, this is the corticosteroid study, and it compared standard of care, which was laser versus one milligram and four milligrams of IVT. So for the SCORE BRVO study, basically there was uh, no difference between the three groups. And the steroid groups were more likely to have complications like high pressure and cataract formation. So after the SCORE BRVO study, we really didn't change much what we were doing. We kept doing macular grid, and that remained the standard of care. This was different from the SCORE CRVO. So before steroids, we were just doing laser for neovascular complications. We weren't really doing much for these patients at all because macular grid laser didn't work. We didn't have anti-HFs. So these patients were really just two different doses of steroids versus observation. And the steroids did better than doing nothing. So, so for BRVO, grid laser remained the standard from SCORE and CRVO, do steroids. Don't, don't do nothing. And then Bravo, so this was our ranibizumab study. And this led to ranibizumab getting an F FDA uh, approval for BRBOs. And the ranibizumab patients did significantly better than sham. So just remember, this is ranibizumab. This is where anti-VEGFs became kind of our standard of care. Cruise, same thing. Patients did better with anti-VEGFs than nothing. At this point, like we weren't even really doing steroids, so they were able to just do sham. So it's like two doses of ranibizumab versus sham, and obviously the ranibizumab patients did better. Okay. So really the big drawback to the anti-VEGFs is that we just have to keep doing it ongoing. I have CRVOs that I've been treating for seven years, and I try and spread them out one week beyond 11 weeks. They get macular edema, they lose vision, and we go back. It's just crazy, but we just got to just keep doing it. <laughs> so there's other treatments we do, obviously, now. These, there's studies for these also, but they're not kind of the key core landmark studies in vein occlusions. The Ozardex study was called Geneva. I think the big thing to remember is the ILP speak with Ozardex occurs more around eight weeks, where the IVT, you see it usually around a month. Um, but the... Uh, Ozardex patients did really well. And then um, ILEA had to get to do their studies to get their FDA approval as well. And those are called Galeo and Copernicus for CRVOs and the Vibrant study for BRVOs. But those don't tend to get tested on quite as much. So really kind of our standard um, that you'll see us do for vein occlusions is start with anti-VEGFs monthly, then try and treat and extend. We'll add in steroids, whether that's IVTs or Ozardex, and then we can add in laser grid if we're unable to extend or also if we're worried about poor follow-up. Um, as far as um, the neovascular complications, this can be pretty complicated to treat, and we're lucky here to have really good glaucoma colleagues to help us with some of these neovascular complications. In the retina clinic, we're usually using a combination of anti-VEGFs with panretinal photocoagulation. Um, often they'll go on to need uh, omid valves or tubes to control the glaucoma or perhaps even a diode laser. The nice thing about the anti-VEGFs is you can see the effects very quickly, but the PR, PRP is going to give you your longer duration of effect to control the neovascular complications. Um, so I think um, kind of historically people have tried to do a lot of other things for vein occlusions that have been pretty interesting. Um, not anything has worked really as well as anti-VEGFs or steroids, but they're kind of um, historically interesting. So I mentioned that people did um, pretty well if they developed those collaterals um, either across their RAFE or the optociliary shunt vessels. So people have tried to uh, surgically create these anastomoses, and people have tried to do really hot laser burns in each quadrant to stimulate the retina to create these anastomoses, or people will surgically go in and basically just uh, kind of use a blade to create an incision at the uh, venous congestion sites <coughs> to allow an anastomosis. Um, 
didn't work very well, <laughs> and it's pretty high risk. Um, people have also tried to go in with a retinal vein occlusion, and I mentioned how the occlusion happened at that sheath where the AV crossing site is. So people would go in and try and open up that sheath and allow outflow, sheath and allow, allow outflow. And then also there's been reports of people using robotic surgery to cannulate the central retinal vein and allow an improvement in outflow. Um, and this is an interesting uh, surgical procedure that people did, and obviously this was before anti-VEGFs, before steroids, but you'd have these horrible central retinal vein occlusions that you couldn't control, um, and people would basically go in, and I, I did this when I was a fellow, so it's, it's not that old, <laughs> but it, they did not do well. But basically you do a vitrectomy, you take your MVR blade, and then you'd go in at the optic nerve and take your MVR blade and stab it into the optic nerve to the level of the laminate cribosa and <laughs> make a big incision. And the idea is just to allow drainage. Without the right. so you have so much blood. <laughs> yeah. You gotta turn up the pressure really high. But then they would end up having a lot of hemorrhage in the eye afterwards as well, and we didn't really have anti-VEGFs to control it. Yeah, it was just crazy. But I did do that when I was a fellow, but we don't do it anymore. <laughs> I don't even know, if those patients probably aren't around anymore. They were, <laughs> too, okay. Um, do you guys have questions about vein occlusions, the vein studies? Are you gonna keep them straight? What Does was that the help way, at all? What was the way you remembered the BVOS and CVOS? Okay, so, well this, so I figure like that's practically the name of the disease, right? So it's okay. BRBO, CRBO, and it's so they got the name of the disease, so it's the oldest study. Okay. And the oldest treatment was laser. So it's the oldest study, they got the name, so that's how I remember it. Okay. I don't know if that helps. Oh, that. yeah, it does. I, I think I that's like the worst part of like it's the weird. retina book is just all the freaking studies. All the studies, I know. <laughs> but I feel like those three. And they're like so old, we don't use them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But the BBOS and CBOS was important because it kind of defined the natural history, right, yeah. for us. And, um, but I just remember because it has the, the name of the disease in the title, so it's the oldest one. I don't know. That's how I remember it. I don't know if that helps, but that's how I remember it. It's, it's true. Um, and then score for corticosteroids and then Bravo Cruz. They have the R in their name for random. I know, but it is the hard thing about the retina book is all the studies, you know, marine, the anchor. But that's why, you know, I don't think you need to remember, like, Geneva. That's not as critical as SCORE or BDOS. Okay. You guys look tired. <laughs> Did I bore you to death with the retina? <laughs> I have a few questions. Let's see if you know these or if you paid attention. I don't know. So what has the highest rate of neovascular of the iris. Hemi retinal vein occlusion. But then after that, it's CRVO. Um, but I mean, we don't see hemi retinal vein occlusions that much. When does the neovascularization occur after CRVO? Yeah. And then what about a CRAO? One month. Yeah. Okay. You did listen. Does anyone know? I didn't say this. Does anybody know what this is? Oh, SUSEC. Yes! Your UBITS people. Nice. We get consults for it all the time. Do you really? I did when I was on consults last year. How often do you see it? Never. <laughs> <laughs> I saw it. I see one patient I see, and it was my patient. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think I've seen my talent patient that has it. Too. I think, yeah, we probably all have seen it. <laughs> Okay, so you have an old patient, central retinal artery occlusion. You can't see an embolus. Yes. Okay, most common quadrant for BRBO. Yes, CRBO, yes, superior temporal, about 60% of the time. Okay, laser treatment for retinal vein occlusions, landmark study. CVO. Yes, yeah, yeah. Just loop, group, yeah, group them together. Okay, CRBO, what part of the ERG? V wave. Ophthalmic artery occlusion. It's both. both yeah, yeah. A and B wave. That's absent A wave. Okay, how many minutes? Perfect. Okay. Who has listened, even though you look so tired? <laughs> Just our tired faces. <laughs> <laughs> that sucks, the 7 a.m. lecture, huh? Yeah. Morale gets a little low in September. <laughs> <laughs> 
Because <laughs> you have so many lectures. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, yeah? So after you have like a branch retinal vein inclusion, or um, how long does it take before like findings of the retina like go away, or what will I see like after the patient's had one sick? So we had a patient in clinic yesterday actually that presented a little bit late, but she had an episode of hypertension with a lidocaine infusion over like 200 systolic, and then felt like the next week she noticed the division along that was blurry all over. So she'd already been dilated, so I could check her EPD, she had history of so it was like six weeks later that I saw her. So mm -hmm. I was like thinking, I was like, I don't know the progression of like where the condition. Well, if she didn't have any treatment, you know, so if it's a mild vein occlusion, it could resolve over, you know, several months, but usually there would still be some findings. You could also have hypertensive retinopathy that could cause more acute hypertensive changes um, that could resolve with resolution of blood pressure. Did you, you didn't have any findings on exam? No, so I didn't find anything. So I was like looking and I was like, and I checked her, she had optic neuritis in the eye, so she had normal color vision and no red D sat, no pain. And then um, her vision was just a little reduced, but we didn't have her baseline visual acuity to compare to. So Dr. Lynn just thought it was her cataracts, but I was like wondering about. I mean, usually if it's been six weeks and they had a true ischemic event, yeah. vein occlusion, you would see something. You know, you would see sheathing of the vessels, some retinal hemorrhages, you know, long term, a severe BRBO. I mean, you'll, I'll look in a retina, you'll see that collateralization across the median rough A. I mean, that can take months to develop, though. And you can see that and you'll be like, oh, they had a vein occlusion years ago. And I'll still look in an eye and you can tell based on the shunt vessels that it did happen. Um, unless it was a really mild event, it, would res it wouldn't resolve that quickly. because I'll see those like dot hemorrhages from PDD that in triage and they're still there four to six weeks later one dot hemorrhage and two dot hemorrhages so it takes time for the retina to, to kind of clear that okay. any other questions okay um, so next time I'm supposed to talk about oh yeah this is what we're supposed to talk about Um, but I'm supposed to talk about ocular ischemic, ocular ischemic syndrome, hypertension, sickle cell, coats, macroaneurysms. Do you guys want me to just prepare the lecture and we just talk and do some questions? Or I mean, I know we're supposed to be doing this like flipped classroom. Do you want to do it where we break it up and do some cases? Or what's better for you guys? I think we could do a more like FA rounds format. Like okay. Doing the first pictures and okay. things and then having the potential. Okay. Okay, we'll do it that way. So you guys don't want to prepare. Yeah, I'll look, yeah. I mean, the hardest ones to find is gonna be the sickle cell. I'm gonna to have to take those from. Uh, <laughs> Julia? Yeah. I'm sure she has some. I know, that's the hardest one is like. But yeah, okay, we'll do it more like FA rounds. That would be good and go around and talk about cases. Is that everybody okay with that? All right. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Yeah. Brad, come on. Yeah. Which is half because um, Rachel's got a lot of stuff. But it's still cool to come to seminary.